Hey guys, Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today we're gonna to be talking about the history of NAC or N-acetylcysteine, how did it come to be? And we'll just do a brief overview of some of the benefits on a timeline just to give you guys an example of how powerful this supplement can be. Now before we do, please smash that like button, helps the search algorithm. Let me know your comments down below on the topic. Really like to know what you guys are thinking. So NAC, what is it? So we have N-acetylcysteine. So L-cysteine is actually a natural amino acid. You can get it in meat, seeds, uh, nuts, you know, eggs. So it's a really important sulfur-rich amino acid. Now, the benefit of a lot of animal products is you're going to have more sulfur-rich amino acids than plant-based proteins. So that's kind of the benefit of eating animal products is you're going to get that higher sulfur compounds, which have lots of benefits in detoxification, brain health, um, helping with inflammation, boosting up antioxidants. That's the reason why being vegan or vegetarian is not going to be the best. Just Primarily, you're going to get incomplete amino acids, and when you get them together with food combination, you get a lot of carbohydrate with it, and you're going to get a lot of anti-nutrients. So if you have digestive issues or gut issues, it could be very problematic. So history of NAC. NAC started um, looking for a, a way to synthesize in a patentable way L-cysteine, and so they were able to add this N-acetyl group to it. It's a natural compound, but the acetyl group to it, the N-acetyl group to it made it more let's say better absorbed. And that absorption was what was patented. So a drug company came along in the 60s and, and patented that. And it started being used for its mucolytic properties in cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic lung issue. And the lining of that lung, that synovial lining typically doesn't have that good fluid to keep things um, moving and gliding well. And so NAC was used to break up a lot of that mucus, which you can get a lot of lung inflammation and lung infections with cystic fibrosis. Also, they used it for a lot of mucolytic issues, upper respiratory tract issues. They would break up that mucus and recover and decrease inflammation because it would help with superoxide dismutase and it would help with glutathione. So it helped with a lot of powerful free radical disbursement neutralization when you had upper sinus issues, upper respiratory issues, because it would break down the mucus. It would help with the superoxide dismutase. It would help with glutathione. So it would be a free radical scavenger that scavenger would decrease a lot of the inflammation from whatever that infection was. And then over time, they also found that it had the ability to decrease viral replication. So you can go look at some of the studies looking at NAC and decreasing virus replication. And that's actually one of the reasons why it was pulled from the market over the last few years due to all the things that are were happening. And so that had, that's kind of some of its benefits. Also, it was used early on, I think in the 70s as well, for acetaminophen or Tylenol overdose. If you go look at some of the data taking Tylenol, it actually neutralizes and decreases glutathione. And then when that happens, you don't have the support from glutathione, your master antioxidant to decrease the stress on your liver. So when you take in Tylenol, it knocks down that powerful antioxidant glutathione, and now your liver is under lots of stress and lots of attack, and you can go into liver failure when you do a Tylenol overdose. So the benefit of NAC is it's the precursor building block for glutathione that then can thus protect your liver for, uh, for and against the Tylenol. That's why if you're giving your kid Tylenol for some reason, or you're taking Tylenol, you know, it's an acetam it's acetaminophen, essentially, it's a central nervous system um, depressant. So it's kind of depresses or let's say um, anesthetizes, it decreases the sensation of pain. It's not an anti-inflammatory, but it's going to decrease the sensation of pain. And a lot of times they'll stack NAC or they'll stack Tylenol or acetaminophen, you know, with the ibuprofen, like they'll take ibuprofen three to four hours, Tylenol in between, you know, before you go to an opiate. And so they find that over time, it can really deplete glutathione in the liver, thus making your liver more prone to damage. So if you're giving your kid Tylenol, or you're taking it, make sure you combine that with NAC. Now, what's a good dosage? I would say for a kiddo, probably 500 milligrams is a good dosage for the day. I would say an adult, I would say one to two, so now I say 500 milligrams, and I'd say one to 2,000 milligrams for an adult, upwards potentially to three or four, depending if you have an active upper respiratory issue with mucus, and you'd want to take that two to three times during the day. Again, one of the big side effects that you know if you have a problem with NAC is you start getting drier mucous membranes, drier eyes, drier sinuses, drier mucous membranes, drier mouth. So if you start to taper up with the NAC, you may notice that as a problem as you go up. And if you do, just back off the dose, no big deal. And if you're taking it like one to two times during the day, you may be better off taking it three to four times and not take it as much at once to kind of trigger that drier mucous membrane kind of effects. There are other herbs that are great mucolytics too, like the guaiac bark, guaiacs, what you may see in like uh, mucinex 
or some of those over-the-counter products. Again, Mucinex is going to have lots of dyes and preservatives and colors and maybe even gluten. So I like taking the guaiac bark by itself. But NAC is my first line of defense because the thing I love about NAC is it gives your body the building blocks to make glutathione. So if you take glutathione in, whether it's in a reduced form, a liposomal form, or an acetyl form, that glutathione is going to go where it's going to go. So the body doesn't quite have the ability to make it and disperse it where it needs. So you don't quite have that local transportation effect of that glutathione. So the benefit of NAC is you are endogenously going to be able to make it better and disperse it better than just giving it in, right? Giving it. It's like if I just inject something to your body, right? You're, it's going to work locally first, like a steroid or antibiotic. The benefit of the NAC is your body can use that raw material, disperse it, and then convert it locally and get it out to where it needs better. So you give your body better control when the NAC building blocks are there. That's why I love it. It's super cost effective. And I love to add it in when anyone's sick. It's an important part of my antiviral immune protocol because it's going to decrease the upper respiratory issues. Most people that end up being older and that get a pneumonia, that could be the last infection they get that could take them to their grave. And so if you can decrease the chance of that mucus and that lower oxygenation and that secondary potential bacterial pneumonia, you really give that person a great opportunity to survive that infection. And so I love it for all those purposes. Side benefits, lots of studies on NAC and glutamate in the brain. Glutamate is going to happen when there's inflammation in the brain. Glutamate is connected to all kinds of things, memory issues, mood issues, OCD, trichotillomania, like pulling your hair out, those kind of OCD type of issues. And again, glutamate can rise with MSG, monosodium glutamate. It can rise from excitotoxins like aspartame, right? And so one, avoid those foods, number one, but you can use NAC to decrease the glutamate in the brain from inflammatory foods. That glutamate could be there from gluten. It could be there from some of those toxins I mentioned. But the benefit is if you can reduce those things and use NAC at that you know, one to two gram level, some of the studies, some of the studies that don't show benefits, in my opinion, they do too low of a dose. And also you can't just do NAC and then add in the MSG and all the other crap in your environment because that's not fixing the underlying issue. It's like you're, you're lighting a fire in the house while you're putting it out and you continue to light it. You have to stop lighting the fire, stop adding inflammation to your inflammation bucket, and then you can have a better effect using supplements to calm down the brain. So I love it for Reducing glutamate, which is great for OCD, you know, touching the light switch, uh, excessive rumination, the extreme things like trichotillomania, pulling your hair out, those kind of things. So really good on that front because people like that are going to be stuck in the psychological world with a lot of potential medication with a lot of side effects. And NAC doesn't really have much. And the biggest thing I see from time to time is going to be the dry eyes, the dry mucous membranes. So I would say a gram to two grams is good maintenance. And I would say two to three if you're dealing with acute issues. I take at least two grams every day. And my kids have any issues at all, especially ear infections, right? Because a lot of ear infections come from sinus issues that then go down the eustachian tube into the ear and kids have more of a flat eustachian tube. So it's easy for mucus in the nose to go to the ear. So it's easier to keep that mucus flowing and free. That way you can flush it out and it can drain better and has less likely to create an infection. So I love that out of the gates. So daily dosage that should be taking, it's good. Yeah. For B6 and B12 and selenium, I mean, typically, you know, your standard dose is going to be pretty good. I'd have to look at my, my B vitamin synergy is the general recommendation for B6 or B12. Um, you can't really go too high on B6 and B12 because it's water soluble, especially B6. You'll just flush it out. B12, your body can store it up a little bit. So you will see that there. And then selenium, usually two to 400 micrograms is great per day. That's a good one out of the gate. And then regarding like my B vitamin synergy, let me just look and I'll get you the exact dosage on that just so I can give you specific numbers. So it might be vitamin synergy here out of the gate. You know, we're typically going to have in there about 100 milligrams for like your B1. For your B6, about 50 milligrams. For your B12, about 250 on the micrograms. And this is per capsule. Your folate, about 340 on the LMTHF folate. You know, we'll do anywhere between one to two. If I see a lot of high methylmalonic acid or higher homocysteine above eight, we may go three to four and then retest on that. Um, you can take it, will it thin out your blood? I mean, anything that reduces inflammation that has an anti-inflammatory benefit could have some blood thinning reducing um, capacity because when you reduce inflammation and free radicals, anything that causes inflammation causes your cells to stick together more. So if we decrease inflammation, there could be some mild blood thinning effects for sure. It's definitely plausible. Is it harmful to the liver to be nebulized glutathione? Um, 
albuterol on occasion and taking NAC. You can definitely, like, if you look at some of the early uses for NAC in asthmatics, is they would take NAC, mix it with saline, and they would nebulize it in. I think that can be good. You know, you, I would only do a couple hundred milligrams at a time, and I'd make sure it's pure NAC from the highest sources with no additional excipients like rice flour, none of that junk. Make sure it's very clean, open the capsule up, blend it in with some saline, and use a good nebulizer. Again, if it's very acute. Ideally, if you just take it oral, you can get most of the benefits. So it depends on how problematic it is. Again, I'll also use reduced glutathione as well, and we can nebulize that. And typically the one that I use, I'll put the link down below, justinhealth.com slash glutathione. I like that one because it's mixed with sodium bicarb, so it's very soluble, and you can breathe that in, do 100 milligrams at a time is fine, and mix it with a good high-quality saline solution that's meant to be used with nebulizers. Taking with food, I think it's fine to take it with food. NAC, you can take it without, um, but either one I think is fine. All right, guys, great questions out of the gate. Hope that helps. I'll put links down for the NAC that I use. I have a detox aminos product that has NAC at a lower dose with calcium, the glucurate for estrogen detoxification, plus all the other amino acids, methionine, cysteine, taurine, glutamine, and then also reduce glutathione as well. And thoughts on serapeptidase for excessive mucus. That can be helpful too, or any type of, um, like I love ginger as well. Ginger is awesome and great for mucus as well. Um, enzymes like that, empty stomach, really good for blood thinning, serapeptidase. Um, pancreatic enzymes are great as well. NAC is going to be my, my go-to on top of that. The more you can stack these things, the better. All right, guys, if you want to reach out to myself or my team, my coordinates will be down below. If you need functional medicine support worldwide, I'm there for you guys. Link down below. All right, guys, have a phenomenal day. Take care.